Okay. Thanks everyone for uh, coming. We're super excited to have Jenny with us, um, reigning all the way from Australia, although technically she's uh, American, <laughs> but awesome. Um, so, so Jenny is a, a senior lecturer in the School of uh, Sociology at the Australian National Universe, uh, University. She is a social psychologist and technology theorist. Her work addresses human technology interaction, role-taking and the ways politics, power, and values integrate into technological systems. Jenny holds an uh, Australian Research Council Fellowship for the study of ethics in tech, is a chief investigator on the Humanizing Machine Intelligence Project, and author of How Artifacts Afford, The Power and Politics of Everyday Things. Super excited. Jenny, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you so much. Um, and as I said to Elizabeth and Edward, happy inauguration day, everybody. Um, thank you so much for coming uh, for coming here um, today after uh, I know we've been talking about politics quite a lot this year, this month, these last four years, but this time it'll be about politics of technology. So hopefully it'll have a little bit of a different flavor. Um, so I do want to begin. There's a there's an tradition we have in Australia, it's one of my favorite things I've learned since being here, of recognizing the original owners of the land from which we speak. So I want to begin by recognizing the original owners of this land that, that I'm speaking from today here in Canberra. And the land belongs to the Ngunnawal and Nambri people. I acknowledge that these lands remain colonially, colonially occupied and they've never been ceded. I also want to thank the co-hosts, uh, Elizabeth and Edward, um, who I feel like are my email best friends now. Uh, as well as Julia Chu and Tina Echo, who have um, uh, helped out quite a lot as well. Um, so today I'll be talking, oh, let me, I should probably share my screen, huh? Uh, sorry about that. So today I'll be talking about um, my uh, recent and also first book, How Artifacts Afford the Power and Politics of Everyday Things. But I'll also be going beyond the book um, and outside the scope of the book in hopes of sort of pushing myself to think a little bit broader and deeper, but also hopefully to spark some conversation here today um, and, and moving forward after the talk. So I'll start off by giving a broad overview of the main arguments in the book, um, the culmination of which is an operational model of technological affordances, which is called the mechanisms and conditions framework. I'll then apply the mechanisms and conditions framework to socio-technical configurations of relevance to the theme of this seminar series, which deals with race, racism, and design, but I'll also sneak in some class and gender as well. Finally, I'll take some time to talk about the relationship between sociology, my home discipline, and design, which is yours, but one that I'm sort of increasingly infiltrating and hope to learn more about um, through conversations with people like you. Um, so I will begin with an overview of the book and its main arguments. Uh, so how artifacts afford the power and politics of everyday things takes the fundamental premises of social technology studies, that technologies are social, that materiality matters, that artifacts embody so human social relations, social values, and socio-structural socio arrangements. And I'll filter these through uh, a single concept, technological affordances. Affordances are how the features of a technology or its technical specifications affect how that technology functions. Affordances shape but do not determine direct technical utilities and flow on social relations. Affordances mediate sort of more concretely between the buttons and levers of a product and the patterns and rhythms of society. Uh, the concept of affordance began in the uh, 1960s and 70s with JJ Gibson in an effort to sort of overthrow Gestalt psychology and instead make the case for direct perception as the, the driver of human environment. Uh, relations. Um, and he said instead it was sort of a more direct kind of relationship. Um, in the 80s and 90s, Don Norman, who is here today, um, uh, brought the concept to design studies. And I think that's probably how many of us sort of came to, came to learn of the term. Um, positioning the designer as a psychologist with the task of communicating to potential users how to engage um, with an object via that object's design, 
Um, a really widely uh, referenced example of this is how a door can communicate whether you push or pull based upon the configuration and location and shape of a door handle. That concept has since spread across multiple fields, education, engineering, philosophy, anthropology, communication, and um, to some extent, sociology. Um, it's resurged in the last decade as scholars have, have kind of scrappled to understand rapid technological growth in the form of digitization and now especially automation. This disciplinary spread and contemporary surge of the concept speaks to its analytic value. Affordance is an efficient and effective way to approach socio-technical analyses. It's a really useful device for avoiding determinism on the one hand and radical constructivism on the other. However, despite its conceptual prominence, or maybe because of it, affordance remains plagued by two lingering critiques, binary application and an implicit universal subject. By not binary application, I'm referring to assertions that affordances are either present or absent with outcomes that are either inevitable or impossible. By universal subject, I mean acting as though technologies operate the same way for all people in all times in all contexts. These issues of binarism and universalism are not only antithetical to basic principles of social technology studies, but also very often antithetical to the otherwise critical perspectives put forth by those who use the terms affordance as the term affordance as an analytic device. And perhaps more relatably, these binary and universal uh, depictions of technologies don't resonate with the lived experiences of anyone who's used any technology ever, right? That's, that's not how they, that's not how that works. Um, and so what I'll argue and what I do argue in the book is that affordance's analytic trouble doesn't come from um, poor original theory. I think that, you know, Don and JJ Gibson both sort of uh, theorized in the dynamism of affordances, nor does it come from uninformed or misguided scholar practitioners. But instead, I think what it comes from is, is the overloading of a single concept that's now trying to do sort of too much work on its own. Um, so to deal with these lingering critiques of binary and universal, and universal application, uh, the book transforms affordance from an overloaded concept into an operational model, which I call the mechanisms and conditions framework. This model shifts the orienting question from what technologies afford to how technologies afford, for whom and under what circumstances, overlaying the concept with a critical analytic lens that attends to politics and power in socio-technical systems. The mechanisms and conditions framework has two interrelated elements, as you might guess, the mechanisms and the conditions. Uh, the mechanisms are the how, of affordances and the conditions address uh, variation across subjects and circumstances. Um, so before delineating the mechanisms and conditions framework and giving some examples, I hope you'll come with me on a brief theoretical interlude um, to discuss the central assumption of the book and of the affordance framework um, now reoriented for how, for whom, and under what circumstances. And namely, the thing I wanna talk about is uh, the framework the, the theoretical um, foundation of the framework. Uh, it rests on a model of technology as materialized action, which is actively distinct from the model of socio-technical relation put forth by actor network theory, a paradigm that still very much dominates formulations of social technology studies. So um, ANT's sort of main thesis is that humans and technologies or people and things operate in concert to construct an actor network. ANT positions humans and technologies in symmetrical relation and distributes agencies equally among them. Humans and technologies for ANT are collaborative or at times combative. They're actants within an actor network shaping each other and shaping the situation. For example, an ANT practitioner uh, would uh, would not say that this remote presentation is facilitated by computer hardware and vid video conferencing software, but that computers, software, our desks, our chairs, um, uh, our speakers, our microphones, and us as speaker and participant are all co-participants uh, co in the talk. Um, if either Zoom or I became uncooperative, 
and decided to sort of take a break, um, the situation would break down. So, I mean, even just from that, even if you weren't familiar with A&T, that would probably seem like an appealing way to, to think about technology. And it is, right? At face value, A&T is very appealing. Um, and its central place in the course of technology studies is, I, I think, well-deserved, right? So A&T teaches us in no uncertain terms that materiality matters, that technologies and humans are imbricated and generative, that human technology relations at individual, situational, and societal levels uh, come together to create something bigger than any individual part. So what I'm about to say isn't so much an attempt to erase actor network theory, but instead to reposition it as a flawed but useful stepping stone along a theoretical trajectory, but a trajectory that now requires new tools. So as the field of feminist and science and technology studies has pointed out, the, the problem with ANT is its assumption of human technology symmetry. This idea or assumption of undifferentiated distribution, a distributed agency treats human subjects and technological objects. It treats people and things as ontologically indistinguishable. In doing so, it obscures and dilutes the distinctly human factors of politics and power or whose interests are served served and whose hegemonic control preserved. It also makes it much harder, if not impossible, to identify responsibility, to locate the social origins of technological implements, and thus to hold power to account. Actor network theory theorists, actor network theorists uh, have countered that these issues of politics and power are outside the scope of the theory, which from a pure logic perspective makes sense. However, if we understand that the social is political and that societies are power infused, then a theory or a paradigm that can account for these variables of politics and powers and power is fundamentally insufficient in scope. Uh, technologies materialized action, which was an, a, a build on a and a, a turn from a and really, um, was put forth in what I think is sort of an underappreciated work by a guy named Ernst Schraub, um, and who deals with this problem by distinguishing between agency and efficacy, placing the former agency exclusively with, exclusively with humans. Efficacy here refers to the capacity to affect change, and agency means to enact will. So Schraub's materialized action approach begins with the assumption that while humans and technologies are co-shaping and mutually constitutive, they always trace back in the first instance to human agencies. Technologies are conceived, built, and used by human subjects deriving from the norms, values, and practices and beliefs of the societies from which they emerge. I fully understand and appreciate that there are deep philosophical and existential debates to be had about the nature of agency. And these debates and um, arguments and theories might trouble Schraub's sort of very simple agency efficacy distinction. However, I'm less concerned with these debates than I am with exposing power and piercing its protective barrier. In this sense, the distinction between efficacy and agency is an expedient one sidestepping metaphysical questions in favor of humanistic priorities. The affordance framework that I put forth and that I promise I'll talk about in just a second, uh, this mechanisms and conditions framework is thus founded on a materialized action approach that distinguishes agency from efficacy and, and doing this enables an interrogation of politics, power and social responsibility. Um, so I'll move on now to the mechanisms and conditions framework, which is the main substance of the book. Uh, the framework is how I transform affordance from a singular concept into an operational model. And in doing so, how I try to sort of deal with these lingering uh, issues of binary, binarism and universalism that in practice affordances hasn't yet shaken. So we'll talk first about the mechanisms of affordance. So the mechanisms of affordance deal with the problem of binary application. Rather than objects affording or not, we can think of technologies or suites of technologies or artifacts as requesting, demanding, encouraging, discouraging, 
refusing and allowing social outcomes. Technologies thus push, pull, respond, and resist with varying degrees of force and accommodation. Requests and demands are the bids a technology places upon users, how it invites, deters, compels, repels, or entices. Requests make some action or trajectory seem obvious, perhaps appealing. Requests draw the user down some path in lieu of others. Demands make the action seem inevitable, preclude alternate options, and perhaps, uh, and perhaps predicate use on a particular set of engagements. Encourage, discourage, and refuse are how the artifact responds to bids placed upon it. Does it support, acquiesce, or object? These aren't ontologically different from requests and, dem or, and demands. They just sort of approach the socio-technical system from a different angle. So think about trying to manipulate objects on a screen using your finger, right? If it isn't touchscreen enabled, uh, if it isn't a touchscreen enabled device, you will be refused and the screen will instead demand mouse and keyboard operation. It allows neutral in intensity and direction, and it applies to bids placed by both humans and by artifacts. One may do something, but the features don't compel one way or the other, right? So for example, a traditional coffee mug requests immediate cons consumption, while a coffee thermos encourages mobility and delay. Each allows coffee, tea, soup, or any other hot liquid of the consumer's choosing, right? In this way, a hard wooden chair requests sitting, but discourages sitting for very long, while a lazy boy, boy recliner encourages prolonged relaxation, um, but for many of us, uh, makes getting up quickly refused. So um, before moving on to, oops, sorry, before moving on to the conditions of affordance, um, uh, uh, there are two sort of general things to point out about how the mechanisms operate and how sort of the model as a whole operates. So the first thing I want to say is that affordance is referred to more than just that for which the technology was built. Technologies certainly have intended functions and as Don would tell us, they should communicate those functions, right? But the people are creative, but people are creative and do sometimes really surprising, uh, surprising things, right? So for example, the front facing camera on a mobile phone um, by design encourages shareable self-portraiture. But it also allows me to check for spinach in my teeth before I teach a class, right? Um, when we think about Black Twitter, this isn't a product of Jack Dorsey, uh, Jack Dorsey putting together some sort of racially conscious design, but instead an organic com community formation using existing platform tools to establish collective identity, in-group norms, and amplification of racially marginalized voices. Uh, so the first thing is human creativity, right? Intention matters, but so does, uh, so, does, so does agentic usage. The second thing is that these mechanisms, request, demand, encourage, discourage, refuse, and allow are not exhaustive, rigid, or definitive categories, nor are they a typology. Um, what they are is analytic stopping points with porous boundaries that set a vocabulary for consideration, deliberation, and debate. They're a standard tool with which technology, technologies can be variously read. Reasonable people may disagree over the designation of some feature as strongly requesting versus demanding. You may go back and forth with yourself in your own head about whether something is allowed or if it's really just lightly discouraged. Um, the mechanisms of affordance don't provide answers to these questions, but set the literal terms of debate. Right, so setting these terms, I think, is especially relevant in light of affordance's disciplinary breadth and its practical relevance to processes of design. If we want to build better things in any sense of building, it helps to speak the same language. And so that's sort of what the mechanisms and conditions framework helps us do is speak the same language as we deal with the complexities of analyzing and making. Okay, so there are two parts of the model. Um, the mechanisms of affordance that we just talked about deal with this binary problem in affordance theory, um, reconfiguring dualistic technological, socio-technical relations into instead a continuum. Um, rather than asking what does this object afford, the mechanisms of affordance ask how. The second ele element of the model that I'll talk about now, the conditions of affordance, address the problem of implicit universal subjects and implied static circumstances. 
It does so by mapping how, how affordances situationally vary. So what is requested of you may be a demand placed upon me. What is here and now allowed may be there and then refused. So here's where we're asking for whom and under what circumstances does the object afford in various ways. In the mechanisms and conditions model, the mechanisms uh, of affordance are conditioned on three broad dimensions um, that make up these conditions, right? Um, perception, dexterity, and cultural and institutional legitimacy. So does a subject know what the features of an object are and how these features function? What do they perceive about the, about the object? Are they skilled and physically able in the object's operation? What is their dexterity with the object? And how is one's engagement with the object supported or not by cultural norms and institutional mandates? How empowered or disempowered are they in the technology's use? Uh, these conditions, perception, dexterity, and cultural and institutional legitimacy are entangled with and inform each other. So for example, one's social support in, in technological use likely informs how skilled they become with the technology and how skilled they are likely affects their perception, revealing or obscuring what the technology can do. Right? We can think about women in STEM and computing. If girls are taught to be intimidated by math and code, that is, they aren't culturally and institutionally supported, they're also less likely to develop computational skill sets or dexterity. And they may also remain unaware of or misperceive how algorithms operate. And there are a couple of recent empirical works that I just sort of want to highlight because I've been reading them and that's exciting to talk about them, but also because I think they do a really good job demonstrating um, kind of the, affordance, uh, the, the conditions of affordance in action. Um, so one comes from Matt Raffalo's work on race and class dynamics of technology use in, uh, in schools. Um, and he shows that for kids in predominantly white upper middle uh, upper class schools, digital play is supported, valued and integrated into pedago pedagogical curricula. Um, this results in students who develop skill sets that prepare them for high level careers and in innovation. In contrast, kids of color in less affluent schools have access to technology, but their digital play is stifled. It's deemed either a, a threat to learning or irrelevant. Um, or in other words, digital play for uh, less affluent kids of color is not culturally and institutionally supported. This informs how they come to understand the functions of hardware, software, and the platforms with which they engage, delimiting what is technically possible and plausible, and in doing so, also reproducing opportunity structures and life chance trajectories. And the other, the other piece of work uh, comes from Jen Schrady's ethnography of digital activism in Southern Union movements. And she shows this really interesting um, dynamic in which leftist union movements, which we, uh, we often think of leftist groups as sort of the most technologically savvy, but this is not the case, uh, is, is what she finds, right? Um, instead, leftist union movements in the South especially are generally pretty inactive digitally. And this has to do with skill, access, and resources um, or knowledge and dexterity, but it also has to do with a race class vulnerability and the cultural and institutional legitimacy entailed therein. Poor workers of color are disempowered from digital tools because these channels of communication are also platforms of surveillance. So she highlights, for example, the black women cleaning crews at the University of North Carolina do want better wages, but can't risk their livelihoods to ask for that publicly. Um, Okay, so that's the model. <laughs> so when we put it all together, um, the mechanisms and conditions framework transforms a concept into an operational model. One that shifts affordances orienting question from what artifacts afford to how artifacts afford for whom and under what circumstances. This is meant to operate as a scaffold, a transferable device that's adaptable to purpose. By design, the framework transcends disciplinary boundaries applies to any object of study from simple tools like pens and paper to the most sophisticated advancements in automation and digital governance. It can be dialed out to investigate high level questions about social cohesion, division, autonomy and surveillance, or dialed into specific questions about button placement and menu options. 
And the mechanisms and conditions framework can be a tool of both analysis and design, a way of systematically mapping what is and of systematically planning what will be, maintaining at its center this sharp focus on the human element of, of objects and design, how politics and power are built in and how politics and power are remade or alternatively can be undone. So uh, to get outside the abstract a little bit, I picked a, a couple of examples. Neither of these are from the book. So if you're a person who has read the book, these are fun and new. Um, uh, and what they do is just illustrate the mechanisms and conditions framework sort of in action. Um, example one highlights the racialization of technological affordances. And example two is gendering. Um, both examples incidentally are bathroom focused. So, um, so the first example, let's talk about soap dispensers, right? So these are now common features of public restrooms um, and they request efficient hygiene made all the more significant, of course, in the context of COVID. We were talking about uh, before this, Edward and um, Elizabeth and I, that sort of everyone's now a COVID researcher. So I had to sneak some of that into this talk too. Um, but these, so, so they request efficient hygiene. This is again, uh, all the more important given uh, pandemic conditions. So the dispensers refuse tactile operation and demand heuristically guided proprioception with the user sort of guessing and adjusting for the ideal placement of their hands. Should the hand washer wish to, wish to disinfect without touching surfaces, they are encouraged to do so. Should they attempt to touch, to touch activate the dispenser to push a button, they will likely be refused. If they leave the bathroom without engaging the technology, this will be gross, but allowed, right? However, and infamously automated soap dispensers are bad at reading dark skin and better at reading light skin. In practical terms, this means that when white people put their hand under a soap dispenser, the dispenser responds and delivers cleaning fluid. When black people put their hands under a soap dispenser, it's often the case that nothing happens. In the mechanistic language of affordances, those with light skin are thus encouraged to use the device, while those with dark skin are discouraged or refused. These variations are premised on cultural and institutional norms of default whiteness, dehumanized racial othering, and the continuation of subtle but powerful pinpricks that marginalize and exclude Black people in public space. I also think it's worth noting in the context of COVID that the default whiteness and anti-Blackness of these particular technologies, which are hygiene purposed and built to reduce germ spread, not, on, not only make public space symbolically less welcoming to people of color, but also literally more dangerous. And this within a context of viral spread and death that concentrates in communities of color. Uh, um, of course, I'm using the skin dispensing soap dispensers, uh, the skin sensing soap dispensers here as a synecdoche for uh, the myriad technologies that directly and, and indirectly assume and presume whiteness. Um, facial recognition technologies that can't read dark faces, for example, cosmetic lasers that are ineffective on dark skin, policing algorithms that ignore systemic racism, and band-aids that equate beige with flesh. Um, together, these technologies request whiteness in ways that reflect and perpetuate the existing racial order. And as a side note, I do want to point out that when I looked up um, Creative Commons or publicly available imagery for um, uh, touch-free soap dispensers, all of the hands, every single hand was a white hand in those images. So if there was a body in that image, it was a white body. And I thought that was um, uh, um, an interesting amplification of the point. Um, okay, so, uh, so having talked about soap dispensers, we'll say on the technology of bathrooms theme, and we will talk about the second example, which is space toilets. Um, so toileting in space has two key challenges, gravity and waste management. Space toilets have to be designed in a way that prevents the escape of bodily excrement, and they have to deal with excrement in a safe and efficient manner, disposing of the solids and recycling the liquids into drinkable water. On the International Space Station, which is the current apparatus is made up of a separate bowl and funnel combination, 
with a high suction fan, which the astronauts activate each time that they embark on a bodily mission. Um, okay, so the two part apparatus, funnel and bowl, channels liquids and solids down their respective paths. Liquids go through a heavy chemical filtering and then back into the ship's water supply, while solids are packaged and released to burn up in the atmosphere. Applying uh, at face value the mechanisms and conditions framework, we could then say that the International Space Station toilets request fan activation upon entry, otherwise you're dealing with a very messy escape. They encourage efficient resource management through urinary recycle, and they demand bodily comportment that keeps liquids in the funnel and solids in the bowl. This is a read on how toilets afford. But of course, we have to also ask for whom and under what circumstances. So after 60 years of putting people in space, uh, NASA is now spending $23 million rebuilding their toilets. One of the main issues in, in the redesign is that the current toilets um, have a limited capacity to process waste from women. Like many social frontiers, space was originally reserved for men, and the technical infrastructure of the International Space Station reflects this. The gendered trouble with space toilets is that they strongly discourage simultaneous expulsion of liquids and solids, or dual ops, as um, is apparently the NASA euphemism. So avoiding dual ops is more challenging or not impossible for women. This means that without adaptation, the, the International Space Station toilets, and thus the International Space Station, requests men while discouraging, or in some cases, refusing non-male bodies. My Google research into this tells me that women astronauts have developed tips and tricks, which they informally pass along to one another. These involve things like bodily position, straps, walls, and foot placements used to adapt for a system that was not built for them. Thus, circumventing the toilet's refusal and making it into, at best, an allowance. The new toilets, again, I should remind us 60 years later, um, better accommodate women's bodies. They're being designed in consultation with women astronauts to more effectively accommodate female anatomies, uh, such that the technology configures to multiple bodies rather than demanding that some bodies reconfigure themselves. My understanding is that this involves reshaping the urine funnel and strategic repositioning of the devices so that the funnel and the bowl can be in simultaneous use. Thus, a toilet that once assumed men now allows gendered variation. As a side note, the high suction fan will now come on automatically, which for I think probably the betterment of all refuses omission of fan activation. What I like about the space toilet example is that it's at once extraordinary and mundane. It's space, but also the bathroom. Right? I also like because it highlights the problem of binarism and universalism in both analysis and design technological systems. A binary take on affordances would leave us to discern whether the International Space Station toilets enabled or prohibited use. This precludes recognition of the creative capacities of women astronauts who adapt, adjust, share, and render the technology accessible. By instead asking how, we can document and trace the dynamic nuances of the socio-technical relation. In turn, we can get outside of universalisms by addressing for whom and under what circumstances the technology variously operates. Universal subjects are almost always privileged subjects and most often remain unmarked and unnamed. By privilege, I mean the luxury to not adapt, to not notice, to live in a world that was built for you without the explicit acknowledgement of that advantage. The conditions of affordance lay this luxury bare. By asking for whom and under what circumstances, it becomes clear that astronaut has been historically marked male, challenging and empowering designers to remake a system with different gendered assumptions. And similarly, these ideas, these how, for whom and under what circumstances, these identifications of politics and power and opportunities for rebuilding and remaking apply to things like soap dispensers, skin sensors, algorithms, and race. Um, so what would it mean to do design with the mechanisms and conditions framework? So far, I've been focusing primarily on socio-technical analysis, interrogating the design of objects using the mechanisms and conditions framework, and I've only been giving sort of vague and periodic allusion to the practices of making. 
So what I wanna do is take just a brief moment here and talk about how the mechanisms and conditions framework is not just about analyzing what is, but also about doing, making, remaking, building, and rebuilding. Or in other words, what would it mean to use the mechanisms and conditions framework as a tool of design? The way it would work is very much in line with design thinking approaches more generally that begin at the end and begin with the social. By that, I mean mapping what you want the technology to do, how you want it to request, demand, encourage, discourage, refuse, and allow across subjects and circumstances, and then working backwards to inbuild the features that serve those ends. So the theme of this seminar has to do with racism and design. So let's start there with a very plain question. How can we make anti-racist technology? To set expectations, I don't think I can meaningful an meaningfully answer that question in a general sort of talk. And the reason for that is because I would need a lot of time, probably a lot of collaboration, but also because um, the specifications of any technology are gonna be tied to the actual technology uh, under analysis. So you can't quite make generalizations in that regard. Um, however, the process would be the same no matter what technology you were talking about, that the process would transcend technological types. So with an affordance framework, the way that would operate is you would start with a high level brief, right? For instance, we want the technology to demand race consciousness, refuse white supremacy, and encourage voices from those who've been traditionally uh, quieted and marginalized. From there, we'd get more particular. In the context of X technology, whatever it is, what would race consciousness look like? What levers, buttons, algorithm, and contours would action anti-racist priorities? And from that, we would build. Once built, the affordance framework comes back with its analytic elements that we might check, that check what we have against what we intended. If white supremacy is not refused, if marginalized voices are not uplifted, then what needs adjusting, changing, undoing, or remaking? As a tool of design, the affordance framework and affordance thinking thus assumes a cyclical character. It foregrounds a design process that's iterative, emergent, agonistic, and never complete. It positions design as a practice that never solves, but only resolves. Map, build, analyze, rework. Okay, so the last thing that I'll, that I'll talk about um, before we can get to some Q&A um, is this relationship between design and sociology. Um, uh, and, and I wanna sort of talk about this as a potential for a kindred disciplinary hybrid. Um, yeah, so right, so one of the things that I think the mechanisms and conditions framework does um, implicitly is it converges sociology with design. And I think that's a really productive convergence. Um, it takes the foundational sociological prompt of how, for whom, and under what circumstances, and applies it to the practices, theories, and materialities of designed objects, while taking the foundational premises of design thinking as an anchor for sociological inquiry. Although design studies, of course, considers the social, and although sociology, of course, considers the material, their transdisciplinary enjoyment strengthens each of these in the other's image. Sociology brings a rich, a rich history of analyzing social patterns and populations and the world that those patterns and populations make. Design reminds us that the social is material, the materiality is social, and that worlds emerge from and through designed configurations. For both design and sociology, worlds are made rather than inherent. Sociologists would say that they're socially constructed. Designers might say that worlds are built, contoured through tools, objects, and spatial arrangements. Sociology can bring to design longstanding theories of how specifically designed objects reflect and shape social structures and micro-level processes. I'm thinking here about queer theory, critical race theory, intersectionality. In turn, designers can ground theories of the social, insisting on the tangible application of ideas that otherwise too easily float in the air. Together, sociology and design are optimally situated to make the strange familiar and the familiar strange, to show how the objects of daily life are infused with politics and power, and how the newest and highest tech, 
reflect and foment recognizable social assumptions. Sociology and design are also poised to collaborate towards meaningful societal change to envelop literal making in a, in a sociological prism, prism and to ground the sociological prism in the materials that make us. The Mechanisms and Conditions Framework is a true transdisciplinary hybrid of sociology and design, and I think also sparks out into other, into other disciplines. Um, I ask that we think more about this intellectual kinship and its potentialities. We can certainly talk about this today, but also as we move through our lives and our work, I implore each of us and all of us together to consider breaching disciplinary bounds and to make better theory to build better worlds. Uh, so that. That was super great. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was... Any, that any questions? Floor is open. Anyone want to start us off? Any brave souls? Come on. Uh, what first inspired you to write this book? Um, yeah, well, so what first inspired me to write the book is um, I had been uh, reading, I'd been applying affordances in my own work and sort of doing a bad job of it. And I was getting feedback from, um, I got feedback from one reviewer, especially who sort of said, you're just using this word like it has no history and you're using this word, you know, um, over simplistically. And I hadn't really looked into it much. And so I started to look into it and I started to notice how the term was used. Um, and I uh, noted the problems of binarism and universalism. And I had a um, really robust conversation with a group of students in a class when I was teaching it. And we sort of together started to come up with this alternative framework that could do the work that affordances wasn't currently doing. Um, that turned into a blog post and then a journal article and then eventually a book so that I could sort of say all the things about it that um, I didn't have space for elsewhere. Yeah, I love this idea because like it kind of combines two different ideas like like, you know, like design and then like this whole universalism idea. I, I kind of like that. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Um, no, I really, I really appreciate that feedback. Awesome. Frank posted a question. He's, he asked, what are some major technological changes you'd like to see for today's technology? Well, that's a loaded that's, question. That's, lo <laughs> that's a lot. I know. Um, uh, I mean, so I think one of, what do I want to say about this? Um, so what are the major technological changes? Like for existing technologies, um, it's not, the, I, so rather than saying an actual technical change that I'd like to see, I would like to see a change to um, slower processes. Uh, I don't mean slower processing power, I mean slower processes of, of rollout for technological systems. Um, we've seen Silicon Valley sort of very famously operate through a move fast and break things mentality. And we have seen that it's not just that uh, the technologies break, but that, that there are um, societal breakdowns that come, that come with that. And I think it is worth it at a social level, but probably also at a business level to uh, incorporate norms of slower design and considered design um, so that the things that go out in the world are um, constructed thoughtfully and with mechanisms to sort of adjust as needed because inevitably those adjustments will be necessary. How do you think that interplays with the whole education of like iterating, iterating fast? I mean, I guess this, that is what you're saying is that that's the, that's the mentality of iterate fast, deploy fast, try it, see how it breaks. But you're saying that that viewpoint really leads itself to not not very well thought out. Yeah, I mean, it can be so so it be, can be really damaging. And we've seen it be really damaging, right? And I think For especially sure. it's been acutely damaging, I think, in instances of automation, right? So like, oh, let's let's put out this, you know, chatbot and see what happens there. And then all of a sudden, right, like, 
Twitter's f- full of racial epithets. Like, um, let's put out this hiring algorithm and we can be objective about who we get. And all of a sudden, it's like all white guys again who are getting hired for management positions. Um, and so it's not that uh, an iterative process of learning where you have to sort of try and get feedback and try again isn't useful, but maybe a lot of that could be done sort of behind the scenes before things roll out commercially. Michael has his hand up and then Don. Don, we'll move to you after. Hi, um, two different things. Uh, one is the, uh, some of the disciples of Gibson had the idea of effectivity, which yes. I think addresses some of your concerns. I wonder if you've used that. So a standard example would be a set of stairs affords getting from one floor to another, but if you're in a wheelchair, obviously, you don't have the effectivity of being able to walk and therefore you can't ascend or descend. So uh, my first question is just, is that a concept that you have used in your own writing? Um, I had, I used it in the book. Um, so, I, so yeah, so I talk some about, so I do talk some about this and I think that concept of effectivity is, is really useful. Um, the trouble is when we start adding a lot of the trouble in the critique is when we start adding a lot of new concepts onto an existing concept, what we end up with is sort of, again, this like crowded and um, uh, kind of crowded and bulky theoretical space. Um, so I think effectivity gets kind of enveloped into the mechanisms and conditions framework or the for whom and under what circumstances. Um, and the stair example is, is really, uh, um, I think famously applied, right? So there's also been work about like stairs, um, stairs enable getting from one floor to another unless you're in a wheelchair. And also it depends on the, con- the, the relationship between your leg length and the riser height, right? So it becomes this really uh, sort of complex socio-technical relation between the human and the thing um, that I try to sort of streamline with the model while kind of enveloping those, those other mm-hmm. elements. Yeah, it seemed to me in your space station example, that was a very good term to use about the different effectivities of the male and female human body. Anyway, that, that's the first point. Actually, a sub point. Uh, Irving Goffman on frame analysis. Uh-huh. Um, is that factored into your approach? The idea that we are within a particular frame and this might be a transient effect. You go to the doctor. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Oh, terrible. Um, or or the, the social role. Right. Oh, great question. Um, great question. I mean, I think those implicitly are woven throughout. I don't have them. So I, don't, I haven't written. I don't, haven't, like I don't cite Goffman when I talk about this um, uh, or social role theory, but I think those assumptions are kind of woven throughout. In, in the for whom and under what circumstances and how we're engaging the technology, especially in kind of the default ways uh, that we assume uh, that we assume it, it ought to operate and will operate. Um, yeah, it's really interesting. Okay, thank you. And, and the second question, and I really will stop. Um, I've been thinking a lot about architecture and the affordances of a building yes. and the idea of whether a building would have a body schema of its own. Mm-hmm. Um, how, I mean, a staircase is obviously a particular localized aspect of a building. Mm-hmm. Uh, is there a literature that you have addressed about the problem of the architect as a whole? Um, so I, a, a tiny bit, a, a tiny bit. So I talk in the book, I talk a little bit about hostile architectures. Um, so implicitly building in ways that uh, dissuade particular uses in particular populations. So sort of designing against particular uses rather than for. Um, I've not directly engaged with um, the sort of designing for particular kinds of bodies other than some, um, uh, a, a little bit in disability studies, but not as extensively as I would as I would like. Though I am, I just got an email like two days ago from an architect who is interested in thinking about um, and applying those in kind of a deeper and more systematic way. So I think that is a, um, a, a very relevant application of the ideas. Okay, thank you very much. Don? Okay, I'll, 
I'll try to keep it shorter than uh, Michael, but I'm not sure I can. Um, the, I, I've been in the process of rethinking um, basically the theoretical approach that we all take to, to being in the world. In fact, the term being in the world comes from Heidegger, which is one of the people uh, I've been trying to read more accurately. I have other people trying to explain it to me. Um, and I'm working with a group of people who are looking at things like uh, Maturana's autopoetic theory, which to quote what they are, what we are talking about together, does away with the notion of pure objects that exist in themselves and are represented in the mind. And that basically it's a holistic system. It's, a, it's, it's, it's what sometimes is called second order cybernetics. It's a feedback system that is looking at itself. Um, and another approach is uh, what I'm, what is, could be ANT, uh, actor network theory, which I think is a very powerful approach because it says that uh, the objects in the world, the environment, whether natural or built, and the human actors or animal actors are sort of a system together. And it, it fits very well with the work that Ed Hutchins has done on distributed cognition and what others have done. And then there's the, another approach, which is, I've, I've decided to call it the ego, the ego approach, which is the traditional approach that engineers and psychologists uh, and most of us in the Western world have applied, which is mainly, we, are, we think of the human being sort of central and now we analyze the things outside of the body and we understand how they work. And that's why we invent artifacts and they interact with us. It's, um, and there are a few other analyses like uh, Michael mentioned uh, Goffman's work on frame analysis and uh, your work, Jenny, is heavily involved with speech acts, uh, even though you never mentioned the word in the book, but it's all about the speech act theory about <clears throat> refusing, demanding, accepting, uh, et cetera. I think that they're all, all of these approaches are correct. I think they're all different points of view. And, and I, what I really would love to do is combine them. And one of the things that, that I learned from your book and from this talk today is there are components such as power and privilege that are left out of the normal approaches. And power and privilege makes a big difference. So you talked in the introduction about black women uh, who don't feel they have the power to be able to point out or object or change their lives. Uh, although white women with the same impositions upon them would object. Mm -hmm. And that's a power relationship, which is we've, most of us who have built technology and in the design field is, does, well, it's design field is starting to address this and talk about it, but mostly it's absent. Um, and then I wanted to come back to one more uh, thing was when you talked about the Silicon Valley approach, I, I think that's not quite right. Um, I think the points you're making are absolutely right, but let me try a different view on it. Um, because the traditional way that we do things in the, in the design world is iteration. So that we, we do something and if it fails in some particular dimension, we're supposed to fix it. But the why, so why, why don't we have soap dispensers that work for everybody or for that matter, facial recognition systems or this, that. We know that a lot of the technology is horribly biased and it's only recently that it's been, pre, been brought out. And that, why is it only recently? Well, part of that's a power relationship. But I think the real failure is this egocentric centric development and lack of diversity in the development team, which are designers and engineers. And for that matter, the, um, the officers of a company that are dictating what products should be made and how much money should be spent. Because in theory, the, the, if we built these soap dispensers and it didn't work for people with darker colored skins, oh yeah, that was, I didn't notice that. Let's go back and fix that. But they never notice it because they, they assume it, they test it on themselves and they test it on people like themselves. And that's a major societal issue. And I think that, um, that what you're talking about, the book really gives us the tools to start approaching these kinds of issues. Uh, but, it's, it's, but it's not as simple that uh, it's because we're in such a rush to produce stuff that we don't, we don't step back. I think it's much more a, 
a power failure really and, and a lack of diversity. I mean, I agree. <laughs> that wasn't a question. That was it. But that was. If, but it's better than a question because, it, if you like, it's learnings that I have as a result of reading your book and then thinking beyond, and then, of course, now listening to your talk. Yeah. Well, I mean, thank you. That was, you know, I mean, that was really nice for me to hear, especially from you, just at a personal level. And, and to your, I know we're just about out of time. To your, but to your point about. Um, it is more about, it, it's about more than just slowing down. It's also about uh, a, a critical lens at the table. I 100% agree. I think the diversity in tech is a real issue, not just because it's unfair that there's not enough women and people of color there, but because um, people are building products for those who are like themselves and they struggle to imagine the world for others who are unlike themselves. And what that does is perpetuate uh, technical systems that reinforce and amplify unequal social systems. So I think your point is very well taken. And now if we get to the, the other field, which is accessibility. Uh, yeah. Again, it's the same issue, but we design it for people with perfect eyesight and who can read tiny print with low contrast, who, yeah. who can walk, who don't have, ability, don't have handicaps of any sort. And handicap is a strange thing because everybody has handicaps. Uh, yeah. And um, but the, most of the designs just assume not. And, it's, and it's, it's well within the purview of our standard way of doing things to take this into account, but it simply is ignored. As, as you get older and you get more frail and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Once again, uh, the, the mainstream people ignore this. Wow, that was, um, and it, Right on the dot. Um, Jenny, if you have any closing thoughts for everyone, you know, I, I'm sure people would love to hear it. Um, I'm mindful of the time, so if anyone has to drop off, um, feel free. Um, so yeah. Um, I guess I just wanna thank everyone again for coming, especially um, Edward and, and uh, Elizabeth for organizing. Um, you know, uh, thank you, John, for coming. That was fun for me. We've <laughs> been talking on email, so it's nice to, to see you here. Uh, and also, if anybody is um, interested in the book, um, you can get the intro and um, table of contents for free on the MIT Press website. Um, so you can get a little sample. Uh, if you do, if you teach with it, if you end up teaching with it, I'm happy to pop in for a Q&A or something video recorded if our time zones don't work. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I would love, and if anybody wants to contact me over email or Twitter and you have questions, thoughts, criticisms, um, anything like that, I am open and hope to hear from you. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone. And uh, thank you, Jenny, for a great talk. Thanks so much.